righty, welcome. Thanks for showing up. Uh, we're excited as heck to be here today. Uh, the panel that we're about to do is technical challenges in large scale tetherless VR. This is, um, this is something that on the surface it may seem very familiar uh, based on what's going on in the industry right now. Um, however, that we have a very particular way of doing it. First of all, the large scale, if you read the description, we're talking about up to 5,000 square feet uh, volume, uh, where up to 12 people uh, get into a scenario together and are in a virtual world moving around. And um, we're going to dive into all the details of that. But um, it's uh, a pleasure to see uh, the turnout here. And uh, let me introduce our panelists. We've got Adam Massengale. He's, uh, we're all with Motion Reality, by the way, Motion Reality Incorporated. We're here in Marietta. Um, and everyone here, including myself, is on uh, Motion Reality uh, software engineering staff. Uh, so Adam is on the game development team. Uh, we've got some folks on the tracking software team, and we'll get into more about what that means. Uh, we've got Corey Wilder, and we've got Travis Hamrick. And myself, I'm Sean Shepard. I'm on the, uh, the game development team as well. So um, what we have seen in some of the previous sessions um, is uh, a lot of prepared questions uh, on the panels and then a small, maybe 15 minute time for you guys to ask questions. But you guys paid some, some money to come here and I'm thinking that you're probably gonna have a lot of questions after we show you this video and to kind of give you a flavor of what we do because I could probably explain it for 20 minutes um, and, and you walk away not totally, you know, grasping exactly what we do. So without having to take you in and put you inside the physical volume, the best thing we got right now is a uh, quick video, and I'll be talking over it, and it ought to give you a good idea. So we want to show you that, give you a chance to formulate some questions. I will start off with some of mine, and I'll give you the topics uh, that we'll probably want to stay within. Um, so without any further ado... I'm going to show you this video, uh, and then I've got another quick disclaimer before we get into too much. Okay, so you can see right off the bat that large scale, this is our 5,000 square foot volume, and you'll see that uh, we've got some operators in there. So this is a simulation, right? So these guys are going through simulating a military or law enforcement exercise. Um, they're being tracked and they're walking through the virtual house, clearing it, looking for targets um, to you know, determine whether or not they're a threat, eliminate threats, uh, handle them accordingly. Um, and this is all happening in real time. So this is what, you know, some of these points of view are first person and that's what that particular subject would be seeing from within the head-mounted display. And how they're holding the weapon directly one-to-one -one maps to what they're seeing in the virtual world versus their physical uh, movements here. So we got some uh, user interface um, examples of how we go through and set up a scenario, assign different avatars to people, um, set up the different waypoints. And we'll talk about waypoints uh, here in a bit. They're a little different than what you may be uh, thinking right off the bat. But just kind of take a look. We tried to convey the fact that those movements that you're seeing in the, the real world match up to what's happening in the virtual world. Um, so here's a controller workstation. You can see the line of fire. So we've got some additional capabilities that we can show. Um, from a controller workstation, someone who's kind of monitoring and controlling the environment, like an administrator or a controller, if you will, um, operator sometimes referred to as. And um, it's, uh, it's pretty challenging. Some of the stuff that you're seeing may not seem that challenging, but getting that level of uh, fidelity and the high uh, frequency of the tracking with that many people in the same virtual space is something that no other company is doing right now. So it's, uh, it's something that we are quite proud of, actually. But there are a lot of challenges, so that's why we're here today. We wanted to kind of give some of those uh, bits of challenges up to you and have you ask us some questions um, so that you could kind of wrap your head around if you're interested in going down this route. 
And the name of that particular product is Dauntless. And um, there you have it. The cat, oh yeah, so what I was going to say after the video was that um, the, the caveat was that, so I just wanted to put out there that we're going to open it up for lots of questions, and I just wanted to mention that there are some trade secrets. Uh, we're not exactly at liberty to discuss every detail, as you can imagine, uh, because we are on the forefront of, of large-scale VR and this level of tracking. So. Um, please ask any question you'd like, but just bear in mind that if we have to kind of hold back a little bit of information, just um, be understanding. But I think it, the, the answers will be pretty satisfactory, and we'll be able to dive into some pretty good stuff here. Uh, so real quick, I just wanted to mention that um, I brought a, like a sign-up sheet for anyone who's interested. So if that looks like something that you might be interested in, in getting in and experiencing yourself, uh, I'd love for you to, to sign up. Uh, we're going to do some sort of um, raffling process and coordinate with you, get back in touch with you at some later point, hopefully real soon, to get up to about six of you guys to come in and visit us and get in and experience that for yourself. Maybe play some Capture the Flag. Um, so if you're interested, sign up. If you're not, uh, no, uh, no foul. Uh, David actually works at Motion Reality, so we'll start here. Um, so, yeah, just a little bit of information, your name, email is all you really need to put. If you want to put a company affiliation, that's cool, too, and we'll just kind of cut them up and uh, do that. So, real quick, I'm going to go over uh, some of the high-level, can you see if you can get this to show the website? I've got the, um, I've got it in another window over there. I just wanted to have that kind of sitting in the background. All right, thanks. Um, I'm going to just kind of list out some of the high-level topics that seem appropriate that we're uh, prepared to talk about, but if you have something else, feel free. Okay, so um, at a high level, you know, we've got software um, and, and hardware, obviously, and uh, HMD integration, QA testing might not be something that you think of right off the bat, but uh, there's definitely some challenges there as well. Uh, design, art, visualization, uh, user experience, and immersion, if you will. Uh, being pioneers, because obviously no one else is doing what we're doing, so we've been pioneering. Um, and, you know, we can talk on the software front about the game engine, um, networking, rendering, tracking is a very big part of what we do. Um, and that goes for the software and the hardware involved in that. Um, the features that we have uh, for safety, for immersion, navigation, um, our man wearable computers. It's something that we've manufactured and put uh, a lot of time and effort into getting correct. Uh, weapons. Um, so those are, those are kind of the high level ones that uh, I'd like for you to be thinking about. So we're going to spend a lot of time and questions from y'all. Uh, so be thinking of them. And uh, I'll just kind of walk around and give the mic to whoever has the appropriate question. And if that doesn't work out, just speak loudly. Um, Okay, so I just want to start off with a question about motion reality and this type of uh, virtual reality, large-scale, uh, tetherless VR. How long have you guys been doing that? Okay, so we started doing um, VR uh, probably, I'd say, in, I'd say, 07. Uh, with a, um, a system based on, I think, Ogre graphics. We have a uh, in-house tracking engine. Um, we were doing up to 12 people then. Um, we were using computers in a, uh, um, a little suitcase on your back. Uh, it was really a, a different world back then. Um, any HMD that you wanted to use was either a very small field of view screen um, or else it was 20 grand a piece, so we went with very small screens. Um, but we've been doing this probably, I'd say, about nine years now, just doing the VR aspect of it. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's pretty impressive. I mean, a lot of people are getting into this this field here on a much smaller scale, obviously, um, as of late in the past year or two. Um, I want to, and, and as we go, like I said, I, I've got 
questions, I can just run down the line. But if something's set up here that just piques your interest, just raise your hand. If you got something to say, ask about it. Let's just kind of cre uh, create a dynamic here, if you will, uh, so that you guys get uh, what you want out of it. Um, all right, so so that's that's a pretty long time. I'd say uh, from a software game engine standpoint, you mentioned Ogre. Um, you know what what types of decisions had to be made in order to select a, a particular game engine. <coughs> Well, uh, there's a number of factors that go into selecting a game engine. Um, first and foremost for uh, VR is latency, but for serious games where you're trying to simulate stuff and not going for a cartoony look and you want to get as close to realism as possible, obviously graphical fidelity was a, uh, is a big factor. So uh, our Dauntless product, we actually went with CryEngine 3, um, which is a very pretty engine if any of you guys have ever seen games made in it. Uh, but uh, it turns out it was one of the harder lessons that we learned that uh, pretty isn't necessarily always the best thing. Um, it, uh, it optimizes for fidelity over all else uh, versus Unity, which is a very VR-friendly engine, as I'm sure most people are aware. Um, so I mean, just uh, our, our initial pitfalls in just selecting a tool um, set us back. It just like, made everything uh, in order of magnitude harder than it should have been. Yeah, I, I would really love to hear Adam's thoughts on, on CryEngine. I know you've had experience with uh, quite a few engines in your career, so if you could kind of just talk about some of the particular challenges that kind of crop up when working in it. Uh, yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I've worked with a few different engines, um, and our, our particular setup with uh, the version of CryEngine that we have, um, it's uh, unfortunate that we're stuck uh, kind of in a, uh, a fixed version, so we're not getting any updates. And um, we also have a uh, version of the engine that's had several modifications. Um, that uh, in itself makes it a, a little more challenging um, than working with an out-of-the-box solution where you normally have uh, at least some accurate documentation or up-to-date docu documentation. Um, and that's one of our day-to-day uh, -day challenges with our version of CryEngine. Um, uh, in addition, uh, if you look at engines like Unity or Unreal or even new versions of CryEngine, um, the documentation is much more uh, updated and verbose. And, um, in the past, uh, we've had a lot of um, good and talented engineers that have con gone through and worked uh, through this engine. So you're working in code that uh, has, you know, a lot of different personalities and history in it. Uh, so I guess that's uh, that's another. That's thing that's that a good point. Uh, a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of personalities in code uh, is is an interesting. Thing. But I, I wanted to ask about. Um, you mentioned Unity. Um, are there are there things that you guys have done in Unity? I know that, that uh, there was a Unity VR session yesterday, um, or I'm sorry, it was uh, Thursday, rather, that was uh, pretty interesting. And I'm wondering if you guys have dabbled in that as well. Uh, we, we, yeah, so we've started dabbling in Unity. Um, we're finding it a lot better uh, for optimization purposes. It has a lot, uh, many more avenues of optimization than the current version of CryEngine that we're using, particularly in uh, the lighting department, um, Cry has uh, full dynamic lighting kind of out of the box. I mean, you can go and do what you want with it if you have the source code. But uh, for us, we are kind of challenged with having a small team and needing to, you know, allocate our resources strategic strate strategically. Uh, so we can't spend a ton of time or more time than necessary, you know, in the rendering pipeline. I mean, if we wanted to build a, uh, you know, if we wanted to go build our own CryEngine, we would. So, we, I mean, what, 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 what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, no, uh, actually the allocation of resources is, uh, in the small team is, is a big deal. Um, so having a small team is a big advantage uh, for when you're, uh, you're moving fast and breaking things and pioneering and trying things you don't know if they're going to work or not. Um, but uh, again, obviously, you know, smaller numbers, smaller amount of people you can, you know, allocate to tasks. And for something that uh, the challenge we bit off, which is uh, one, trying to be as photorealistic as possible, uh, being totally tetherless, uh, having full body 
uh, motion on 12 different people, um, we, we not only um, you know, have the obvious software challenges and logistic problems, but uh, I mean, we, we, even the mundane problems of, well, do we have cameras that can take pictures fast enough over a network to, to get us updates in time to tell where 12 people are and you know, 5,000 square foot of space? Uh, well, the answer to that was no, they, that's not a thing. So we, we have our own cameras, our own proprietary cameras. Um, um, I mean, the, the backpacks, I mean, MSI just came out with a new wearable uh, you know, VR ready thing, and it's awesome. But that wasn't there, you know, four years ago. So, let me let me ask you about. You said that uh, you know, trying to find a camera that that was able to maintain the pace and the frequency that was required to the to the level that you're able to speak to. Can you talk about um, you know how much are we talking? How fast? How much information? Um, how many cameras, uh, it, something to that effect, if you could talk to the level of computation um, and the amount of math that's going on there to, to keep pace with uh, this frame rate that has to be maintained for a pleasant VR experience. Yeah, I, I, I would say the best way to approach it is, um, is kind of the, uh, we talk about a, a, a photon to photon type measurement where you're saying um, when you know, when the, uh, the uh, LEDs that take a picture of you at a p specific place in the, uh, in the volume, from that point to the point that it's rendered on your HMD, um, needs to be fast enough that, you're, that you don't break the, uh, you know, the, the, um, the belief that you're actually in that virtual world, that the, the lag as you turn your head or, the, um, or as you move, um, especially with, with the 12 people, the reason that you would have 12 people in a space like that is you, is you want 12 people to be able to interact with each other. Um, you want one person to be able to hand something to another person or touch somebody on the shoulder or really be there together as a group. Um, there's no real reason to do this large scale tetherless VR thing if you're going to do it by yourself. Um, being there as a team, um, achieving a goal together, whether it be capturing a flag, whether it be solving a level, whether it be training how to, you know, how to do a scenario in a serious game. All these things are there to, um, you know, to, to have you there as a group. So, you know, if you're reaching over to touch somebody's shoulder and they've, they've since moved a little bit and now you, you miss their shoulder because your, your view doesn't match, you know, where they are, then the effect is going to be killed. So you're talking about some very small times. Um, I'd say trying to get Trying to think of a, of a good solid time, you're, you're you know you're talking about um, what third of a second or less at least. Yeah, you you, um, you know we, we we hear all these recommendations from Oculus and Vive about you know rendering at 90 hertz, and um, and, and that's all legit. You know, please take their word for it. It is uh, you you want to render that cadence, that's for sure. But um, you know, it's just the uh, what happens when you move your head and you know you, you don't move. You know, it's like because the data is cut out because wireless. You know, it's like all, all these challenges come from controlling the whole pipeline. Uh, it just it just makes everything you know that much more complicated because it's not like you know it's like oh the tracking's not working. Let's go call HTC and Valve to you know get them to fix it. It's like oh well, we got to call the dude in that office. You know, um, I mean, uh, but the the freedom of having all that stuff gives us the ability to do this uh, this 12 man system that's not really capable of anyone else's technology. Um, so. And I would say, you know, since you brought up the uh, the 90 frames per second frame rate, something that interesting that we found that we were talking about the other day is is yes, that's very important. But what's is what's equally as important that they don't talk about as much is the cadence of the of the frame rate. So keeping a steady frame rate um, is as important as the frame rate that you're running at. Um, you can get used to things if if you have to run at 70 instead of 90. Just don't let it drop down. Don't let it spike down to 50. You know, keep it at a steady cadence, and your body will will adapt in some sense. But um, you know, going at 90 to 120, and then dropping it down to 30 because you didn't profile somebody, or didn't profile your scene, and now you've got this one angle that you're looking at where it drops your rendering rate down to 20 or down to 50. Um, your body picks up those changes in frame rate about as you know as much as it does picking up the uh, slower frame rate. I saw a question over here. You still have the question? Okay, I'll just kind of bring the mic to you. Uh, so, uh, with the the tracking system, uh, are you uh, do you guys see the future uh, in 
in the way you've implemented the tracking system, uh, which is I think is passive markers, and you have cameras picking up these passive markers, right? I Correct. Think, yeah, I think the near-term future, mm -hmm. um, maybe the passive marker tracking, I think that, um, you know, the industry is always trying to get um, less invasive. Um, so I believe that eventually, um, you know, as, as some of the schemes like a, um, um, like a Connect or like a Vive, those kind of things. Yeah, Vive is kind of like an opposite passive marker kind of thing. And so I'd say short term, the, that marker kind of approach is going to have to be there until the, uh, um, until the tracking systems get strong enough to be able to understand uh, large numbers of people or a large amount of space. So in a, in a small space, like if you're talking about a, a, uh, a game for the home, um, you know, connect and, and, and that kind of technology or, or other machine learning kind of tracking technologies will make it less invasive. But what happens as you gain space um, and what happens as you gain um, subjects is that you start dealing with with occlusion. You start dealing with blobs of large crowds of people that no longer look like individual people. So the challenges get much more difficult um, as you decide to grow and scale. And so I think that's the challenge, and that's where we're kind of at. We're kind of, you know, at a place where a couple of people, you have a lot of really nice options. One or two people, and up to what, like the 15 foot by 15 foot space for like a, a yeah. Vive system? Yeah, like a, a Vive room scale, honestly, for a single person is, is vastly, you know, like we, we have trade offs to support uh, 12 people. Uh, the in out tracking that the Vive provides is, uh, is always going to be lower latency than getting tracking data over wireless, you know, sent to somebody's backpack. Like, that's slow as heck. Come on, let's be real. Um, but the, the, the issue is, is like, how do you get your position in a local volume as a Vive user out to everybody else? Well, using the Vive system, you know, the, that local client has to broadcast either to every other client or it's going to have to make two hops and go from a server back to another client. And that's just, I mean, that's latency that uh, for interactive team goals that Travis were, was describing is just unfeasible. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask a question about the, uh, the HMDs. So in the picture, you can, you can see perhaps uh, that uh, the gentleman here is, is wearing an OSVR HMD. Um, what's the process like to, to get an HMD to work properly in the system, it, 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 do you just open it up out of the box, plug it in, and it, it's good to go, Adam? Or oh, uh, I mean, I guess it kind of depends on um, what your technology stack looks like. But ours, um, we've we've had a, a, a vast amount of challenges um, over the years. I've understood, and since I've came on, um, they have not uh, grown in size. So um, recently, we've uh, picked up the, um, as you can see, the OSVR. Uh, its second iteration, the HDK2, um, we're in, so they've integrated, you know, the, they have the 90 hertz display in there and 2160 by 1200 resolution. So uh, we've been integrating that and one of the main challenges that uh, we uh, have been facing with it is getting the distortion correction in the lenses just exactly right or as comfortable for as many users as possible. Uh, so that's uh, that's an ongoing challenge, um, and everybody's a little different, it seems. So some people, you know, will say, "Well, this this looks just right," and somebody with a different, you know, vision, um, IP, um, IP, yeah, uh, uh, interpupillary distance, distance yeah. will uh, will will maybe disagree with that. So, um, and that kind of gets into QA. We do a we do an, an immense amount of you know back and forth with our QA team on uh, getting those, honing those values in just right to give the most comfortable experience to the end user as possible. But uh, yeah, right now our, uh, our primary head mounted display is uh, um, OSVR just because of its accessibility. Uh, can, you, can you talk a bit about um, your development environments versus what you'll see out? Obviously in the volume, not every developer is gonna have uh, you know 1,200 square, square feet to test out everything every time they make an iteration. Can you kind of talk about the development process and life cycle in a situation like this? Uh, yeah, sometimes it can be pretty pretty darn cumbersome and uh, you, you kind of supplement 
uh, uh, your desk space the best way you can to speed up your iteration process, but uh, that only goes so far. I mean, to really get a true, you know, uh, uh, test of what you're producing, you either got to get out there and see it for yourself or, you know, take um, the word of the QA as, uh, as law, um, and sometimes that'll get you in quite a, quite a debacle, too, because... You know, everybody's a little different, and those guys are in there way more um, than uh, me or Corey or Travis here or Sean, for that matter. So um, their uh, their sensitivity is much better than ours most of the time. Uh, so as long as that is such a subjective experience, like you're saying with the, the inner pupillary distance, everybody's uh, eyes are spaced differently, obviously, and focal length. And focal length. I mean, uh, there's just a bazillion variables that go in there that make QA difficult for VR. Especially um, when you have a whole pipe to QA. Speaking about everyone having a different experience, um, I mean, how many people have actually had VR experiences so far? That's a pretty good number. That's a pretty good number. So you could probably relate to a lot of uh, what we're talking about and, and when we talk about immersion. So um, what are, as far as a lot of people talk about the sickness that, uh, that some may experience if you're doing some of the wrong things. Um, are there techniques uh, that you can talk about that, um, that you utilize to get someone acclimated to a, a VR experience? I'd say uh, one of the first things is start people off. Like in, in, if you're making a VR game, um, start people off slowly. Uh, take time to allow the person to get acclimated. So maybe a, have the first couple of scenes in your game be something that's a little lower pace something that's allowing your, your, your eyes and ears and your brain to kind of believe that you're in the system um, and, and allow you just to kind of, of get a sense for the latencies that are there. Um, I think your, your brain can adjust if you give it time, but if you get somebody in there and the first thing that you're doing before they really even understand who they are in the system is start shooting at them, um, that's just too much and they're just going to get sick and they're going to take the thing off and they're going to say this game is bad because I just get sick. And a lot of times it's not even something technical that you have to do first. You just have to give them a chance to um, to slow down. You know, even understanding, like you're not the same person in VR that you are in real life. You have to understand what your body is, what your capabilities are. When you turn your head a certain direction, what does that mean? What angle are you turning your head? in this virtual world that you're suddenly in. Um, and so taking the time, um, maybe a level terrain for the first floor. Uh, don't make them go up hills. Don't make them turn corners. Um, just let them pace themselves. So, so can you, in this system, I mean, obviously you're working within a volume that's a flat surface. Is there a way uh, that you can navigate rough terrain, stairs, and things like that? Or is it just a flat experience? Uh, we do use um, some ground clamping techniques to translate the uh, player um, vertically in the environment. Um, and we, we, we try to do that in the most comfortable way that we can. Um, and we've found some ways to make it uh, pretty successful. Um, uh, we have a lot less negative feedback than positive feedback. Uh, but, but, but particularly um, on, you know, the f just getting acclimated on how to do that because if you walk up some virtual stairs, uh, in the game and you're trying to do that on a flat surface in real life it's uh not only it's it's disorienting but it's also really comical to watch as a spectator <laughs> because people do like a chicken walk you know i mean it's great <laughs> I, I had a question back there okay let me let me just get the mic to you real quick so i have a question about that a number of years ago i was working with it for a simulation company and i went to, to do mount training at um somewhere up in dc i forget the, the base I was wondering if you'd ever considered or tried putting or using an open mount space that has stairways and such and mapping that into your virtual environment so the stairs are real and it's just a lot of the other details are not. We haven't actually tried it. We've talked about it. Um, I think the, the dangers in that um, are, of course, the mapping. If you get the mapping off and someone, you know, how some people like to like go up the stairs and they just like to hit just like right on their toes, right on the edge of the stairs, 
that means you don't have much leeway in getting those stairs mapped to your virtual world. So if you're off and you're only giving them a quarter of an inch of real stair space and they trip and fall because, you know, wearing an HMD um, smashed to their head, you can have some real trouble. And that's where we started getting a little squeamish about, about doing that. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, it, it was really that though, but if you, if you actually had platforms and stairs and you felt comfortable with your mapping scheme, that, might, that would make it a lot easier. Uh, you know, one of the things that I found, that I think we found in our game is that we do have a luxury that, that most VR game creators don't have, and that's when you're walking in our game, you're actually walking in real life, where in a lot of the, the set-top console kind of games, you're sitting in a chair. So any movement in some of those games are disorienting. We're in ours. We don't yeah, absolutely. We've got, uh, you guys have something really, really unique uh, going on, and that's why I'll pass this about uh, one more time at the end. Um, because maybe the more we talk about it, maybe the more you're going to get interested in getting in and experience it for yourself. So we'll pass that around one more time. But we have a question right here in front. So you said y'all can simulate multiple floors. We want to make sure everybody in the back here. <laughs> so you said that y'all can simulate multiple floors in, a, in an environment. Yeah. How do you deal with the possibility of people standing on top of each other? Uh, great question. Oh, yeah. So uh, we just let them do it. <laughs> no. That's the easiest way, yeah. No, we uh, we we implement um, game mechanics to to make it safe um, because you know obviously you can't share that same physical space, so we use uh, like uh, ghosting techniques um, in the game. That's our primary way of uh, dealing with that. So if I walk up on you in a close proximity, or may and it's uh, it's it's twofold. Um, so it's proximity, but it's also velocity. We have guys that run through this system full speed, uh, you know, because they're they, they're doing serious, you know, serious shit. You know, they're trying to, you know, take out threats, clear buildings. Uh, um, I, so yeah, so we do. So we also factor in things like velocity to make sure uh, that nobody gets hurt. Um, we've also had. Uh, I, I don't know what we call them. I guess we can call them facilitators out in the volume, um, for uh, particularly for new people in there that haven't ran through the volume a lot. So if we if they see a collision that might happen, because you know you can put a ton of game mechanics in, but accidents are gonna happen, right? I mean, go outside and drive in Atlanta, right? So, uh, you know, you get you, you get orthogonal with somebody uh, where you know you just you there's no good way to see them. And you don't want to distract too much from the training, so uh, we'll have people out there sometimes to kind of keep it safe. Um, a lot of people will talk about in virtual reality the the uncanny valley. Uh, you probably heard that uh, quite a bit. Um, what level of realism uh, would you like to achieve, and are you achieving? And do you run into issues with the uncanny valley? Uh, well, as a serious game simulator, we want to be as uh, realistic as possible, so we don't really have the luxury of making it a gamey, cartoony art style. Uh, and as such, we are much more likely to fall in the Uncanny Valley. Uh, Travis mentioned earlier, our earlier product uh, was called Vertsum, that had a smaller HMD uh, with a small field of view. Um, and it obviously didn't cover your whole face, so you could see the outside world, and it wasn't fully immersive. Um, and we found switching from that system to the new one, people's expectations uh, basically matched the, the improvements and everything. So, so as soon as you have the full HMD on, suddenly tracking was like, you know, everyone noticed this little judder and we're like, okay, well, well clearly we introduced some sort of judder in the tracking and we go back and, you know, it's all, it's all positions and rotations so you can objectively measure how much a, a you know, dynamic body shakes. We go back and it's just like the judder was an order of magnitude worse in the old system. It's just that since we have such better graphics, such we had you know better field of view and better everything else, it's people's expectations. Their brain have to have that extra information that you know they can't just that that sense of disbelief you know isn't there. You don't have you know it's like any misstep you take and it's people just instantly jarring. This feels like this alien thing, and you really just trying to trick the brain into thinking that they're somewhere they're not. Yes. Um, got a question here? Or I'm just scoot back stay over. In the 80s. Yes, stay in the 80s. That's good. What were the major hurdles with your uh, wireless networking to get all of that uh, synced up? Uh, well, um, 
I can talk a bit about the hurdles. Uh, unfortunately, I can't talk about some of the specific solutions. Um, but I will uh, start off with this as uh, wireless is my own personal hell. And if you can avoid using it, uh, I would. Um, Wi-Fi, 802.11, whatever flavor, um, is, is built for throughput, not latency. Uh, you're just, you're going to have issues. You're going to have to have a billion strategies to uh, compensate for it. I mean, that's just the, the long and short of it. It's not reliable at all. Um, I mean, we, we ended up having one building uh, up on Cobb Parkway that was great for like, you know, 10 years, and then we moved to another building just like uh, two miles down the road, and suddenly it's just like everybody's microwaves are running, and you know, it's like you know, constant interference. And it, it's to the point where we get like a little Y spy device, and you know, we sit there doing like you know, spectrum analysis on these sites, like looking at the radiation people are blasting. And I mean, it's, it's absolutely a huge challenge. Uh, we actually had a really funny, um, not that funny because it was during a demo, so we lost money, but uh, <laughs> we had a really important demo, and uh, wireless just cuts out for like 20, 30 seconds. And I mean, you have like your lag mitigation, whatever, per, you know, predictive. <laughs> It yeah. doesn't matter. Like, you, you, 20 seconds of no data is 20 seconds of no data. You're fucked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so that obviously didn't go over well. And we were like, okay, what happened? This is catastrophic. I mean, you know, you can't, we can't just, you know, not have 30 seconds of no game. That's bad. Uh, and so we, we found this, like, specific, like, 5.637 you know, gigahertz, whatever, and could find nothing in that range. I mean, it's valid Wi Fi, whatever, but. Like, we could find nothing that would really cause, like, this huge spike of radiation and just blast our traffic out of the air, except that we came up with one thing, an experimental U.S. Air Force FCC disclosure for a, a transponder for a C whatever giant C-130. thing. Yeah. C-130, which, and we happen to be right beside Dobbins Air Force. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was, that was really neat. <laughs> heard about a doorbell issue Oh, as well. oh okay. <laughs> so, yeah, since we're on the topic of dumb technical stuff, since you control the whole pipeline, you can see all these cool little issues manifest themselves and cascade through. So, one time, we had uh, someone in a small 1,200-square-foot uh, system. It's only 34 cameras versus 158. Two. 152. My bad. Numbers. Hard. Um, and uh, anyway, so what happened is every time the UPS guy would ring the doorbell, the system would crash. <laughs> I mean, we make our own cameras, uh, you know, from, from the, the, you know, the fabrication of the boards to the, the OS, we, we, you know, the, the pistols, everything, like everything's in-house, everything else isn't, it's like Windows, you know, should work, right? And it's just like, okay, why is the doorbell breaking our shit? Like, this is, this is horrible. I'll come to find out that the building uh, was wired wrong and the doorbell was actually wired up with like speaker wire. It wasn't even grounded. <laughs> So, I mean, like, the, the fact that someone would just press this electrical impulse somewhere, like, totally wherever, and it would just cascade through everything and cause this, this failure on one camera, and it, yeah, unbelievable. So, so you guys have uh, a plethora of things that uh, your general VR developer might not have to, uh, to worry about. Um, but, uh, so in terms of hardware, uh, you talked about manufacturing uh, your own man wearable. Um, when, you, when you're pioneer something, pioneering something like that, what's that process like? I mean, what kind of people do you have to have on staff? Is it in-sourced, outsourced? Um, how long did it take uh, to arrive at these things? And I'll say there are some surprising things that you find out that, you know, you know in an industry like VR where you're hoping that everything will go forward, um, you know, where we will work together to solve the problems and push the technology forward, you run into some silly things that, that goes wrong. You notice we're using OSVR, where we, we, of course, started off on the Oculus bandwagon. Um, but then you run into a problem that Oculus, remember how they would, they kept their um, HMD in their, um, what was it, the, uh, it, it wasn't open for Devel resale. Yeah, it was development, in development mode. Yeah, and Oculus will not let us resell their HMD, yeah. nor nor can we even really give it away. Uh, we could we couldn't cover up yeah. their their uh, yeah, logo. You can't cover up their logo, uh, which is hard for a tracking system that needs a marker on top of where yeah. that logo is. You know, uh, so that's you, one of the silly reasons that you might have to choose one HMD over another one is just because hey, we're doing this, we're doing VR slightly differently than what your what you're thinking about when you're developing your product. We're out of the cookie cutter slightly. Uh, yeah, and so you end up having to um, 
basically you know go with a different solution you know, and you'll find that with a lot of different things you have to end up going with a different solution because there will be one small part that is slightly different than expectation and you run into lawyer trouble or you run into um, you know so we end up having to create a lot of things so across platform you know across this interdisciplinary team for us means we have um, of course, we have uh, you know software engineering people, but some of our software engineering people are game people. Some are tracking people, which means some are math heavy. Some are both. Some are both. Um, some are um, you know you're dealing with algorithms, networking, um, game development, uh, peripherals, and where I mean peripherals, I mean maybe some hand created peripherals. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about the peripherals. Actually, uh, I mean that's something that's. You're not going to see too often in a VR situation someone carrying a, uh, a firearm, a rifle like that that we see in the image up there. Um, what kind of what kind of peripherals do you guys support right now? Uh, so the rifle is actually really neat since you brought that one up. Um, we ha we have a we have a rifle and a pistol, but the rifle is really cool because there uh, there actually is a recoil mechanism. So when you fire the uh, the weapon, I mean again we're going for a re total realistic as possible simulator. So I mean, obviously, shooting a weapon with no recoil is not very realistic. Um, so we have a mechanism for that, um, and there's there's no tethers between the, the pack, the the gun. I mean, it, it knows when you shoot. Uh, we have clips of ammunition. Um, so I mean, it's just the whole the whole experience. Are there any? Uh, are is the weapon communicating with the man wearable, or is it just uh, going out into the the, the, the space? The topology <laughs> is that we want to skip a step by going to the man wearable and go directly to the server uh, yeah. to register shots for uh, truthiness reasons. Okay. Um, all right. So I wanted to. I'm kind of curious um, how how you test the system uh, and how do you know when you got it right and how much time do you spend on it because you are such pioneers and time is really of the essence uh, to get products out to the market. I would say as far as how long do you spend trying to get it right, um, if you're working in serious games where you're trying to be as realistic as possible, you're fighting the forever. Un you're working on the yeah, you're fighting the uncanny valley, and in in a serious way, uh, you if you see a shake on a wrist that's distracting, that breaks your suspension of disbelief, and so suddenly you're not really in the world that you are that you think you're in and everything's bad, but a shake or a vibration or a small frequency thing that you normally would, would skip, maybe, um, you know, you have to find those things. And so we spend a long time, and it could be anywhere in any number of pipelines, is, you know, is Cry's, um, is, is Cry's physics system that we did turn off um, still somehow manipulating in some sub library that they didn't check to make sure that it was completely turned off. Yes, that's happened. Um, <laughs> you know, is it is it a a tracking issue? Is it a networking issue where data gets corrupted along a pipe? Is it some kind of a, um, interpolation or in interpretation? Is it some kind of filter? Is it some kind of just you know? We'll go through all of these. Things at each stage of our pipeline having numerous types of, of problems that can look exactly like a shake, and you could blame it on anything you want. And then at the very end of the day, you might find out that the guy who was out there in the system had one, some old glove that had a pop rivet broken off, and his markers were physically vibrating like that. After you've done all this work and gone through this multidisciplinary team of, of, of effort. You know, just to find out his really his glove really was shaking. That's never happened, <laughs> <laughs> not once. So, so what's uh, are are the QA folks on the team? Are they your standard um, software QA folks? Are they you know how, how do you test a system like this effectively? We uh, we chose to get some subject matter experts. So a good chunk of our QA team are actually uh, National Guard members, uh, which has actually been incredibly. Uh, uh, not very fortunate for us the past couple days because they are uh, thankfully helping people in Florida, but it has been bad for our QA. Um, but uh, they uh, they definitely they are masters of their craft and know how to clear rooms and all that. So when they sight up and they say, "Oh, the red dot and the the rifle is not you know the right thing," obviously that's this dude we got to listen to because mm -hmm. I don't know how to shoot an AR-15. So I saw a question back here. Oh. 
Um, what you have is extremely impressive in terms of how photorealistic it is and everything, but uh, being an architect, I'm interested in kind of abstracting certain aspects of it, isolating certain problems and focusing on, on them. So I'm kind of curious about the kind of experiments you must have done. One of the things that I can think of myself is playing with the scale of the players. Uh, think about uh, having the commanding officers sitting at a table, watching the other guys as a little chess table, chess set, mm. walking around in that space, and then being able to maybe interact with them even. Um, things like that. Are there any weird tests that you did that was kind of interesting that kind of gave you results that you didn't even think of? Uh, m most most of our, I mean, we've we've done tests with scale and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, most of the application for our real time mocap engines always been like a one to one uh, type deal. So we talk about it's very possible, and uh, it's something that we are obviously going to probably explore when we get more into entertainment. But since we've been targeting more of just like a one to one, you're this, you know, you're a small <coughs> team doing you know practicing tactics or whatever. It's kind of well, not really advanced. I will uh, say. As far as scale goes, um, we do spend okay. a lot of time at the beginning of a process trying to make sure that your avatar is one-to-one -one with you. So um, they're not generic avatars. Uh, they are scaled to your body. Um, so we, we go through some algorithms and such to, to make sure that, you know, so that when you do reach, you know, reach out and grab something, you're not reaching past something or that a person who's five foot seven who's standing beside you, you go to reach their shoulder and you don't just like jar your fingers into the side of their arm or something like that. You know, it, making sure that you actually hit the thing you're reaching for, especially in a scenario like this where the rifles, the pistols, the people are physical objects in a physical space, but you're viewing them as virtual objects in a virtual space. Um, it does take a lot of, of scaling to make sure that all matches up. So we spend a lot of time working on that. How, how do you, uh, does it just maintain the one-to-one -one relationship? So once you've installed and got it all set up, you checked it, you're good, you can just continue to run, run, and run, and run, and run, and you just do all your testing in there, and you're always going to have that one-to-one -one mapping, physical to virtual, or is there some sort of maintenance process, software, or physical actions, or whatever? Calibration. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so when you set up a, a volume of bunch of cameras, obviously they don't know where they're at in space, um, so you kind of got to tell them. Uh, so when you're trying to figure out where a point is in space and you have you know one or more cameras, it's uh, you you know the more the more cameras you have, the more complicated the calibration process is going to get. Um, in addition to the actual physical locations, um, he mentioned uh, Sean mentioned earlier with uh, the HMDs, a similar problem, nonlinear distortion. Anytime you guys look through a lens, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen how it's you know it's not necessarily one to one. If you look at like a square or a grid, you know you you'll see it barrel out because uh, the edge of the lens gives us like fisheye effect. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so we have to correct for that. Um, and each lens may not be manufactured exactly the same. So uh, there's there's a good deal of uh, information that we have to collect beforehand so we can set up the state of the world so we can figure out where you guys are at in the system. Uh, that's actually one of the, the bigger problems uh, of getting one of these systems going, I imagine. Looking for some questions. All right, here we go. Heck yeah. Have you thought about doing more of a void setup where you'd have actual walls and have redirected walking so that you don't have a military simulation where someone might go up against a wall to go into the door, but they just kind of lean and fall into it and there actually be a wall there? And have redirected walking. Uh, yeah, we definitely uh, we definitely thought about it. Um, unfortunately, for this specific application, um, uh, we don't we don't just give them like a couple levels. You know, it's like we give them this this 500 foot square uh, 5,000 square foot space, and then we give them uh, a bunch of scenarios that have a bunch of different topologies, configurations, uh, multiple floors with you know virtual physical mappings. Um, you just talk about with the you know keeping track of. People. Yeah, I, I want to. I'm not sure if this has been conveyed uh, properly, so I'll just ask the question. So, if you're in a 5,000 square foot volume physically, 
Is that the space that you're confined to in the virtual world as well? Uh, no. Um, basically, you know, it's like it's a. Uh, if any of you guys have used the Vive, you have uh, the room scale stuff. You know, uh, a lot of these games, uh, their their popular mecha mechanism of locomotion, which is I think is brilliant, honestly, is uh, you have like your local volume that you can you know interact with, and you can teleport to another like local space. Um, we, uh, we we don't have that uh, exact mechanism, but we do something um, through waypoints where we can basically have like active areas, and so we can transition from space to space. And while it's not exactly redirected walking, if you arrange the waypoints in a certain way and do the transitions right, you can essentially feel like you're training in an infinite space. One comment about redirected walking, though, is that it generally works best on individuals, and we're working on up to 12 people operating in concert with one another going through a scenario. I think I saw another question here. Uh, my, my question is very similar. Cause okay. I, I was wondering, um, basically, it was like very similar to his, because I was wondering, what, would, was it, what do you do when a player just intentionally tries to go through a wall? Right, yeah. We beat them with sticks. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that hasn't been said about our system is that when you get shot in our current system, <clears throat> we shock you. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you know when you get shot. Optionally, the six people who get selected, it's, <laughs> it's optional. optional. It's it optional. is optional. <laughs> we can crank it down or crank However, it up if you want to be crippled coming out of it. It's up no, to we, you. Uh, we actually, we actually uh, have a number of profiles for you know, like uh, people that are you just want to know they got shot, and then you know the big manly men that they got to show off. Uh, we call that one "Pray for Death." So, so I, I really, I want to bring this up. So, um, are there any incidents? Do you notice a um, a change in people's behavior once they're tactically moving about and they become shot oh, yeah. and, and, and oh, electrocuted a little bit? We've not had, really electrocuted. I shouldn't say that. Stimulated <laughs> electrically. We've had some of the biggest, baddest looking dudes you could think of come in and uh, go through the system, and that first that first shot will turn them into a completely different person. And it's good, right? It's really good for uh, the type of training that it is because it makes them be considerate of you know their lives and the lives of the people that they're training with. So, uh, But yeah, it's hilarious to watch. I love going out there to watch it. Uh, but yeah, that, it does happen. Yeah, I mean, no matter how realistic you make it, it's hard to shake the impression that's a video game. So when people get in your system for the first time, especially if there's some hardened, hardened military, special ops, FBI badass guy, you know, I mean, he's like, oh, look at this video game. I'm in here and shoot with this toy gun. And then he goes around and it's just like, oh, shit, stuff got real. You know, it's suddenly training kicks in. We've had people fall on the floor, grown men. Like, yeah, yeah. What kind of safety things happen in this world and when people get that immersed? Uh, safety so, concerns that we yeah, have. So, Sign the waiver. <laughs> no, we. I mean, we put in as many uh, game mechanics as we can to help facilitate, uh, you know, safety. You know, particularly like we do um, a very similar method to uh, the the Vive, the lighthouse setup, to where you know we 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 have borders for the edge of the volume. We have uh, ghost players. We have. Um, I don't know, a handful of other techniques that we use. Level design, how does that yeah. Oh, in? level design, yeah. We try to design levels to where, you know, it makes sense and we don't, I guess, have people running at each other's, you know, face unnecessarily. Thankfully, we keep most of our scenes where the training, you know, this is not hand-to-hand -hand combat training. If it gets down to that level, then they've already failed the training. <laughs> so, um, you know, trying to make sure there's an expectation there and then being having a spotter or somebody around to make sure that somebody just doesn't like go crazy and start start you know, uh, what about the what about with the uh, with doors and just you know having to simulate the feeling of opening a door how do you how do you guys give a little bit more of that tactile yeah. feel yeah we don't we don't uh, so this is this is where you know our, our system's a little different than uh, like a setup like the void um, we forego you know, putting up you know physical walls and doors, uh, and so it's, just open, it's an open door. No, no, we we do have doors because um, we have we have breaching uh, right. situations and that sort of thing. We implement a game mechanic uh, where you will um, it'll have have like a timer on the door or you know a proximity check to open it that way. Um, you know, some sort of technique like that, and. You don't get that, you know, the tactile feedback, but it does. Uh, it does work for all intents and purposes. Luckily, we're not in, you know, like door trainers. Uh, we just gotta get it open in some means. You don't right? get, you know, you're not doing locksmith training. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I would say the uh, you know the the trade off that we have between those systems with the uh, the haptics or with the with the actual props being your haptics is that um, that limits you to one thing you can do. And a lot of our market is you know the the whole reason that you would want to be in VR is one reason is that you don't want to have to build a physical model of something. A lot of times you're trying to get away from building a physical model, um, and and in addition it's you know. You might want one model, and then the next the next guy might want to play something totally different. Um, in by giving up that using props as haptics instead of maybe some you know you know game controller vibration or some kind of different types of things that hint at ha haptics, is you're able to have different levels. You're able to go from an oil rig to a basement to a um, to a middle of a jet or you know different different types of scenarios in the same space um, without cost without um, you know, having to have a modeling team for every level, or so. even even having to like set up and tear down, you know, actual environments. You know, like uh, you go to the void. I mean, don't 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 get me wrong. I'm not bagging on the void because the void's very cool, and I want to go to it. Um, but I mean, without having like a, a huge installation uh, to support multiple environments when you're doing these these prop mappings, I mean, like it's very hard to do that in a very generic way without either just having you know a large amount of space or reconfiguring, which destroys your throughput. Uh, especially for an attraction type VR experience. We've got a question back here. Uh, just a couple of minutes left as well. So. Um, how does your recoil system work? Go on uh, the simulates recoil. For the I time. can't talk too much about it, but uh, there's a weight and a uh, linear driver, and uh, physics does its thing. Like a solenoid? Yeah. Yeah, I had a, a quick question in the QA side of things. Um, generally, when you like bring people in for like preparation in the simulation, how long does that process take? Um, as long as uh, so you're, you're talking about when somebody comes in to get in the system. Yeah, so uh, it can be as long as they want, um, and uh, sometimes to get accl so to get acclimated, it, it's different for different people. Uh, so we, you know, like we talked about earlier, we run them through some uh, comfort. To make them comfortable, we'll put them in a similar uh, environment that they uh, that. So we'll have all of our trusses, all of our cameras in a virtual environment, and we call it the virtual volumes. The first thing you go into. So it's like, oh, it didn't really go anywhere, but now I'm a, you know, I'm inside of the virtual space. There, there was another question over here just a second ago. Was this you? Okay. I was just wondering, you all seem very heavy into research development and some training now. Where do you see your company going in the future? Are you going to sell products? Are you going to sell the idea and franchise it out? Or where are you going? Where are we going? Uh, well, I'm definitely not on the business side of things, but uh, based on history and what I, what I know about the inner workings, uh, really it's like we're a product-based company and we uh, like to develop solutions, but we are also very interested in strategic partnerships with uh, other organizations. Uh, it's pretty unlikely that we'll franchise or uh, something specific like that, but licensing middleware, like our tracking stuff, isn't probably out of the question. But again, that's not anything I can reliably answer. We're going to take one more question. There's so many hands that went up right over here. Did you have one? I did, but I already know the answer to that question. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's not do that then. Okay, all right. If you know the answer, just. I, I just would like to hear you guys talk about the history of the tracking, fidelity, what else it's been used for. Um, are all parts of the body being tracked? Is anything being simulated, animated? Okay. Um, yeah, our company has a history in, in just motion capture and the motion capture industry in general. Um, our, we've had another company spin off of ours, which was involved in a lot of um, just A-list movie kind of the... That they did the way. Avengers. Yeah. Um, cool. But, yeah, so for us, it's it's... You know, having the uh, the fidelity of, of the tracking of the body is a pretty important part of the history of our company. In addition to entertainment, um, our tracking has been used for sports analysis, for um, biokinesiology experimentation. For um, uh, we actually had a had a relationship with TaylorMade Golf, where you could go get in our system um, and get your swing analyzed, get your um, mechanics figured out they they could um, custom fit you with a golf club based on the data that they recorded from our mocap so um, yes we're tracking the full body um, I don't think there's really any kind of simulation of the 
of the animation. It's all keyframed off of mocap. I mean, okay. Really, oh, okay. Uh, just one, one, one last thing uh, on the subject of what we track. Really, the only thing that's not getting tracked with our system, and this this might change in the future depending on customer demands and whatever, is uh, is fingers and toes basically as not getting tracked. Any last closing statement from Adam? <laughs> No, I mean, uh, they, they pretty much covered that, that question. Um, if you guys have any other questions for us, I know we're out of time, just yeah. uh, come up and, you know, I mean, we look, some of us look scary, but uh, we're, we're <laughs> no, all we're really, really approachable. We're glad uh, you asked all the questions. Thanks for coming out. Uh, we'll be around for a few more minutes and then out in the hallway. Uh, thanks so much.